next speaker is Dr. Ellen Natison. She has a PhD in wildlife and fishery science. Her research focused on fish physiology, evolution, and genetics. Um, previously, she worked for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in Washington, D.C. She's been with the SFPUC since 2007. She started there as a project manager working on collaboration, uh, collaborative project between UC Berkeley, the U.S. Forest Service, and SFPUC dealing with sudden oak death on SFPUC lands. Currently, she's the Planning and Compliance Manager for the Natural Resources and Lands Management Division, which is responsible for watershed stewardship planning and environmental regulatory compliance in the watersheds. Please welcome Ellen. Hi, thanks for having us. Where is my talk? Let's see. Can I close that? <clears throat> okay, here we are. Where's the icon? There it is. Uh oh. Just say okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, as I already introduced, I'm going to split the talk with Greg Lyman. Um, Greg Lyman's uh, an engineer in my group, but an honorary. Um, biologist at this point. He's done a lot of biology and he's the lead for the big restoration projects that we're going to talk about. He's been the lead for, for a long time and everything from design to implementation. And um, in the middle of all this, he was the mayor of El Cerrito. So he's got a lot going on, hard to keep up with. <clears throat> so I'm just going to give you an overview of um, the system and how we came to be doing these large restoration projects. Um, some of the measures that we took to avoid introducing and spreading invasive species during our projects. I'm going to focus on plant pathogens, but I just want to let you know there's, there's a much larger invasive species program that we have going on. Um, and Greg's going to talk a little bit about our enforcement and um, how difficult it was to enforce some of our um, specif contract specifications and our high standards. Um, and you'll hear about how we set the bar very high. Um, I knew from my interactions with Ted Suki and others um, about the concerns associated with plant pathogens. Uh, we went in pretty eyes open and, and very worried about it. And um, there's a lot of ways for these things to go wrong, and um, we discovered quite a few of them along the way. But we certainly set the bar high, and we... Um, set standards that even our contractors and in-house really found, you know, they were a little bit incredulous when we were asking them for some of these things. And um, we enforced compliance, and we still wound up, as you will hear, with plant pathogens. And it's really easy to um, write off plant mortality in the field. You know, we do restoration projects all the time. Even our uh, performance criteria a lot of times were associated with, you know, 30% uh, survivorship was an acceptable rate of, of success. Um, so when you see plants die in a restoration project, it's easy to write it off, but we had a really good team who was really educated, and working with Ted, um, we actually realized um, that it was not just the soil, the water wasn't right, there was actually a, a pathogen issue. Wrong button. Ah, there we go. So just a quick overview. Um, the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission owns and manages about 60,000 acres, and our division, the Natural Resources and Lands Management Division, is responsible for uh, managing the locally owned watershed lands. We also manage the land above the right-of-way, as well as some land in San Francisco, like um, Lake Merced and Twin Peaks area. So the Hetch Hetchy Regional Water System supplies water to about 2.5 million customers in the Bay Area, about a third of those in San Francisco and two-thirds in um, the rest of the Bay Area. Um, it's about 150 miles long system designed about 100 years ago. The system, much of the system has been in continuous operation for over 80 years and um, it also crosses three major earthquake faults. So in 2002, the voters approved a measure to um, improve seismic reliability and um, upgrade and, and uh, repair a lot of the system. 
So it's a very large program, $4.8 billion in the end. Um, hopefully that's the final number. Um, large projects um, throughout um, seven different counties and um, big construction projects. Some of these construction projects, uh, a lot of them were pipeline projects, so they involved unearthing infrastructure that had been underground for 80 plus years. This is a large one in the East Bay that goes under a creek. And other projects had very large footprints, so this is Calaveras Dam Replacement Project. Um, and as you can see from the picture, it's a huge footprint, and this is in a very remote area in um, SFPC watershed lands. So as I'm sure you experience as well, we have um, protected land that is in the Bay Area, and the Bay Area is, there's not much um, land left. And so our lands are habitat to a large number of in, uh, endangered species. And so the habitat um, impacts associated with these projects had a very big price tag associated with it, large mitigation requirements. So we chose to do the mitigation on our own lands. And um, so of the 60,000 acres um, of watershed lands locally, we did mitigation projects on 2,000 of them, so very large mitigation projects. Um, we consolidated, this was very much Greg's doing, we consolidated our mitigation into one uh, program. So instead of doing piecemeal mitigation associated with each of the many different construction projects, it was all bundled together, and so you could effectively do one large restoration project um, to mitigate for multiple impacts um, and bundle it all together for, it was both economical and ecologically made a lot of sense. So a wide variety of different types of projects. This is an example on the peninsula where we removed eucalyptus and expanded a pond and um, did some plantings. And this area um, is created more basking, breeding, and foraging habitat for San Francisco garter snake and California red-legged frog. We also did a lot of wetland projects. This is a wetland creation project also on the peninsula where you can see each of the little colored flags here represents a different plug planting for the destined for the wetland. You can see where we're going to go later with that. Lots of plantings. Um, the plantings were particularly concentrated in riparian and wetland areas. I think this is pretty typical. Um, in a lot of upland areas, you can do hydro seeding or, or uh, more sparse, sparsely distributed uh, container plantings. So I did say that it's 2,000 acres of restoration project, but the major earthwork uh, was more concentrated over 200 acres. So um, <clears throat> you can see all the numbers there. I don't know if I need to go through them, but if anybody's interested, should sort of, the idea is these, these projects are pretty large. There's a lot of planting involved. This is one of the largest projects. It's a riparian project that's two miles long. This area had been used. Um, it, there's been a lot of logging, some heavy grazing in the past, and some dry land farming. And so the idea was to uh, reduce erosion, stabilize the creek, um, and do uh, increase the riparian vegetation along this stretch. And this is another picture of that site. Again, a lot of plantings. You can see the tubecks and the little flags associated with the, um, this site. So this site alone is almost half a million plantings of container plants. About half of those plugs and half of them shrubs and trees. So as I said before, we took invasive species very seriously. I'm sure everybody here is familiar with zebra and quagga mussels, so you know, not too hard to convince you that those are worth worrying about. But other aquatic things we worried about included chytrid fungus, um, which attacks amphibians, plants, the weed requirements for um, Obviously, that's an issue everywhere. What uh, our main focus was was trying to keep on top of the weeds that were already at the site and then also um, prevent any new weeds from coming into a site. So, for example, if we if were evaluating a seed lot, we would screen them for, you know, most seed lots have some level of contamination with weeds. As long as the level was below a threshold, if those weed seeds were uh, not already present at the site, then we would reject it, even if it was in very low concentrations. We worried about uh, plant pathogens, I mean plant pests, like wood boring beetles, but also um, invasive insects like Argentine ants. 
And then finally, the focus for today is plant pathogens. So you've seen these pictures already from Ted's talk. This was a um, study where um, we were trying to treat some tan oaks with phosphites to prevent their infection with sudden oak death. Um, our peninsula watershed in particular was getting pretty hammered by sudden oak death, and we thought, well, maybe we can protect our oaks, uh, our tan oaks with phosphites. Um, it did not work. Um, and so you can see the before and after picture. This was taken by Ted. And so we were getting a pretty good idea just from the sudden oak death project alone that plant pathogens were something worth taking very seriously. So this is going into our restoration projects before we did them. But one thing that really brought it home to me was this site around Philoli that Ted was talking about. So this was, I think, my second day on the watershed right after I'd started working and I was tooling around the watershed with Ted Swicky and, you know, you get very worried about plant pathogens pretty quickly when you're hanging out with him. <laughs> and so we saw this site and he correctly identified what was going on at this site. Um, took some soil samples and confirmed it. And so this is the area right next to Philoli where uh, their landscaping and gardening, the pathogens associated with that operation has sort of eased out into uh, the watershed lands and is sort of a gradually expanding zone of dead vegetation. And these are the dead madrones. So we decided to, to go all in on this. We took it very, very seriously and we exceeded industry standards across the board. Um, some of our, as I said before, some of our contractors were just incredulous at the level of scrutiny we were giving them. And we had, uh, you know, every piece of equipment had to be steam cleaned before it brought into the site. It was inspected at the site. If it had any dirt on it at all, it got turned around. We, um, everything that was brought into the site, like mulch or anything, had to be cleared through our um, our submittal process, and then our nurseries were held to very high standards as well. And so we enforced all this with lots of inspections, and, um, oh, I already went through a lot of this stuff. So um, even, oh, so yeah, the bottom one is the only one I guess I didn't talk about was the aquatic stuff. We were, we were very concerned about anything being brought in on um, boats or pumps or anything like that that would touch our reservoirs. So uh, in consultation with Ted, we decided to base our contract specifications on this manual. And um, it's a pretty rigorous set of procedures for how to run your nursery. And it involves everything from having good drainage, getting your plants off the ground. Well, looks like in this case we didn't get them off the ground far enough, but um, not making sure that there's no weeds, so there's no other host material nearby. Um, and we did a lot of inspections. Um, we organized plants by species, made sure everything looked healthy, and it did. All our nurseries passed all these inspections. They looked good, their operations looked good. We were not just focused on the health of the plants, but also on what they were doing. Um, and, and it all looked fine. Uh, we extended this, as I mentioned before, to our imported materials. We, um, this was an investment, it was a financial investment, but again, as I said before, we knew what plant pathogens could do from our watersheds, and we knew that if we introduced a plant pathogen that killed the plants at our site, we, our investment would be lost. Our mitigation project, the expense that we'd invested in that mitigation project, could potentially be completely lost, because we'd not only have to clean up that site, but we'd also have to go and and still, we still need the mitigation, so we'd maybe have to repeat our, our mitigation effort. So um, we took it super seriously, and so imported materials had to come in clean. So roots of plants, root wads are used in fisheries projects. A lot of fisheries people are very familiar with those. You stick the bowl of the tree, the trunk of the tree, into the bank. It stabilizes the creek, and then the root ball sticks out into the creek and creates fish habitat. Well, roots obviously have the potential to carry root pathogens, um, so we cooked them. So each batch took, we decided to use, um, Paul will appreciate this, we used dry heat instead of steam because steam is dangerous. So um, we, but it took a long time to use dry heat. It's a very slow way to heat up um, 
logs. So in order to hit our target temperatures at the target depths, it took over 24 hours per batch, and it was uh, we could only fit about three logs into each. So we created ovens basically out of a shipping container, and um, propane heated heated them up. So um, this was this was expensive, but we felt like it was a worthwhile investment because we were very concerned about introducing plant pathogens into our sites. All right, so now Greg is going to tell you the rest of the story. Good afternoon. Um, looks to me like a lot of you guys are people who are boots on the ground and, and going into some of these areas uh, on a routine basis to, to perform your type of work. And, and so you're probably sitting there thinking, you know, how does this affect me? And, then, and that's going to be the focus of my talk is to try and put this into perspective from, a, from you know, boots on the ground and project planning. So when we did start, uh, as Ellen has identified, when we started, we identified that we needed to put some things into the specifications to, to prevent this from happening, what Ted was talking about with, with regards to the spread of pathogens. And the specifications we put in performance spec. Ellen already put it up there. It's pest and pathogen free. It's easy to say, hard to do. Um, so it was new to the industry. The industry didn't know what pest and pathogen meant. And as Ellen just concluded, for imported root wads, it meant heating it up, getting to 140 degrees, six inches into the, into the interior of the tree. And as you guys know, wood is a great insulator, and it was taking 24 hours uh, to, get, to do that. Ellen's already covered the nursery specifications. They were new to the industry. The photographs she showed you was what a, a nursery did. They built that specifically for our project. Uh, over a half a million plant plugs delivered to one project. So they built a whole wing of their nursery dedicated to our project using the specifications that we provided. Sanitation. Decontamination. You guys are probably familiar with decontamination as you go in and out of a, a treatment plant or in and out of a, a, a reservoir, but we required decontamination going in and out of our sites. I'll show you a picture of, of uh, a sanitation station, but the idea is you got to clean your boots, you got to clean your equipment, your gloves, your shovels, your you, all of your equipment needs to be cleaned. Your vehicles should be cleaned. Uh, Ted showed a, a perfect picture of a car wash. Uh, where your cleaning is, is important. And the biggest thing we had, as Ellen said, the biggest obstacle we had was the contractors didn't believe this was an issue. They didn't understand the problem. Um, and so what, our specifications, as simple as they were, a performance-based specification, pest and pathogen-free, was very hard for the contractor to bid on and very hard for them to understand how to comply with it. And our inspectors had a challenge of trying to enforce it um, because it, it was so new. So one of, the, one of the things that we did to inspect was we put in an a inspection system in place to go out to the nurseries and look at them, monthly, bi-monthly process, as the plants go from seed to seedling to deliverable product. And we would go out and, and look at them, take photos of them. This is portions of the report. Um, that we had. So this is, uh, you know, they're, they're getting ready to, to, for delivery. This is a toy-on. We'll see this picture again. Sanitation. So we had sanitation sites all on our sites. You're supposed to scrub your boots on the way in, scrub your boots on the way out. The brushes. Somehow the brushes would go missing. So you'd be there trying to get the mud off your boot, and you wouldn't have a brush. There's supposed to be a lid on this bucket so that it wouldn't evaporate. Uh, you guys are familiar with chlorine. Chlorine dissipates over time. Good for a couple of days. They are changing it once a week, once a month. It's not doing its job. So we, trying to keep them to refresh the liquids, keep the brush there, put the top on, have their people even use these things, all their laborers, it was time consuming, very time consuming and Obviously, not as effective as we wanted it to be uh, because we obviously were infected as Ted and Ellen have given you. So despite all these precautions, um, we've got invasive species, new, new weeds that 
came in with somebody's vehicle. Um, as discussed at length today, we obviously have uh, a number of phytophthora that have been detected, up to 10 species at our over, uh, let's see, we've got about 12 to 13 different sites that we are working on, and almost every single one of them has at least one phytophthora species. So this is not just an isolated case, although the, the big sites are, are some of the worst. And there's many nurseries involved. We had four, four to five nurseries that were supplying us with material, and almost all of them had some phytophthora at them. So, so he, despite our nurseries passing inspections, despite our, our specifications to, to isolate the material, uh, get it off the ground, we have it. We have these uh, pathogens present. So again, to tell you, talk to you about the one that, that Ted already highlighted, uh, Phytophthora tentaculata, it, we discovered it in Toyon. And nursery inspections in November 2013, it was ready to go. We put it in the ground. Uh, this is uh, planting tubes. These are designed to browse protection, uh, also to keep it uh, isolated from large temperature swings both day, day and night, planted in the ground. Um, a species that was getting ready, a sample that was coming in to getting ready to be planted, didn't look right. The inspector looked at the roots. The roots were black. Uh, we sent them off to Ted. He actually drove them up there to, to Vacaville, and, and Ted... Um, you know, called me up on Monday and said, the pear turned brown. He said it was hot. He didn't know what it was, but he said it was hot. Um, so, you know, we had to start doing testing and we sent it off to the, the state laboratory. And the state laboratory said, we know it's hot, but we have no idea what it is. They actually had to create new testing mechanisms to find this Phytophthora tentaculata. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't get it using rhododendron. They, none of their normal baiting uh, systems worked. Uh, uh, Ted touched on this, but I want to make it really clear. You bring in your root, your rooted material, and you give it to the laboratory, and they basically have to coax the, the germs. They have to coax the, the phytophthora off the roots onto something else that they know how to, to uh, sequence and get the genetic testing off of. So it, you get a lot of false negatives, because the phytophthora doesn't want to cooperate. Um, that's, not its, that's, not its, that's not the way it's designed to go. Um, so we, we are doing a number of testing out in the field. So this is an aerial view of San Antonio Creek. Uh, you, you can see the creek going down, the, the, the gray, creek, the gray uh, gravel bottom of the creek going down. Every single one of these little dark dots, every single one of these, and this is only about a 500-foot stretch of our 10,000 two-mile long, 10,000 foot two-mile long. Every single one of these dots is an irrigated basin, drip irrigation with a plant in it. Every one of those plants came from a nursery. I don't know the number of species that we planted, but it's, say it's 30 different species. We went out and sampled some of every one of those species. And Ted did a lot of that by himself, not by himself, but Ted did a lot of that. And we have found, fortunately, um, mostly just uh, three species that we're having to go after and do some form of in-situ treatment on. And they represent about 7% of all of these dots. It's a toyon, sticky monkey flower, and snowberry. I'm looking at my coffee. I can't ever remember if it's coffee berry or snowberry. It's coffee berry. Get that one wrong every time. So we're changing our ways. We have to. Uh, the nursery industry is changing their ways, um, albeit slowly. Um, we're in the middle of these uh, projects, putting them together, and we have to change as rapidly as we can. So we have uh, stopped taking nursery plants, and so we are uh, writing change orders. This is, some of these are costing us money, and some are no-cost uh, change orders. We're changing the way we put new seeds in the ground, new plants in the ground. We're doing it from seeds, cuttings, and transplants, which involves seed collection. And we were doing seed collection already, 
but the seed collections were much smaller quantities because they were going to a nursery where they have very high germination rates, 80s and 90% germination rates. We have no idea what the germination rate is for an in situ plant. Requires seed storage and seed treatments. Those are, again, the same as what we were doing in a nursery, but we have to try and do it in, in a way that doesn't uh, involve any infection. And then we're putting it in the ground, and we have to figure out what the timing is, when to, put, when to collect and when to plant. And seed planting methods. What's the count? What's the depth? I'm going to show you a picture of some of these seeds. They're small. Some of them are very small, very light. They're, not, they're, they're designed to be blown by the wind, so they're not designed to be captured and put in a place with your hands. Here's a picture of us uh, moving iris bulbs. Iris bulbs are bulbs. Um, you, you do them by division. You pick them, you dig them up, and you move them. In this case, we, the risk is low for us because we are moving it from one part of our watershed just a few miles to another part of our watershed. Okay, but that's not all. They're all getting washed get all the soil off. That's not all. They're all being uh, treated with a dilute cl uh, chlorine liquid to disinfect them. So, so we're not just digging them up and moving them. We're still having to take some precautions to reduce the risk. And I say reduce the risk because it's not foolproof. Just because we're doing all these precautions doesn't mean it's, it's uh, going to work. Well, we hope it will work. Uh, Tule seeds. You can see how small they are. So in some cases, we're having to deal with very small, designed to be airborne seeds, to move them and plant them. So it's, it's proving to be challenging to sort of do it in the field. Nurseries know how to do it in the nurseries, but in the field, there's very little literature for describing how to do this in the scale that we're trying to do. Okay, we have it. We've got weeds. Uh, we've got pathogens. Uh, our, our protection measures work fairly well. We, we have not detected any wood boring pests. Uh, so the, the logs that we heated was not just for pathogens. We actually took it up to a temperature that would uh, kill any wood boring pests as well. So it's not just uh, pathogens. That, that's the focus for today. But there's, as Ellen pointed out, there's lots of other things you have to worry about. Waterborne, chytrid, snails, uh, ants. On her slide, she was worried about ants, wood boring pests. Those things we dealt with, but not necessarily with weeds. We still have a large number of weeds on our projects, and we have pathogens. What to do? These are the, the suite of things that you can do for treatment. You've got heat, steam or dry. We actually had a, a university come out to evaluate doing steam treatment of our almost 9,000 planting basins I saw a couple of grimaces out there. Yes, exactly. In a remote part of Alameda County, we're talking about over 120 acres, 9,000 little circles in the ground. You saw the picture. They basically threw up their hands and said steam is infeasible. It's not feasible. It's too, it takes too long to set up at each site and move around. You don't have a good power source. It's not going to be feasible. So we went to solarization. Now, heat is useful for a nursery or, or something that's where you've got heat, you've got water, you've got um, access. Heat was useful for our treating of the uh, root wads. The solarization is what we've elected to do for our pathogen infestations in our planting basins. And I've got a photo and I'll go into the details on that. Weeds. Manual and mechanical methods is our preference. We're a watershed. We don't want to use herbicides. But we will, on some specific species, we probably will end up having to use herbicides to, to, be, to really effectively eliminate the non-native invasives that are coming into our watershed. Solarization of an infected basin. Um, this is about a three foot square piece of pl plastic. Uh, there's a, the, the tubes, the, the browse protection tubes. What we did is elected to cut off the green vegetation, or brown in this case, in some cases. Uh, the, the vegetation at the ground surface and cut the, the tube down to the ground surface. The tube acts as containment. The root ball, the infected or potentially infected root ball, we're treating them all as infected. Because of the false negative rate, we assumed all plants of these three species were infected. All. 
And we, the browse protection, we ended up using it as containment. The root ball was inside. All the pathogens should be inside. So we've covered the, the root ball. The, um, there's one piece of plastic that's actually attached to the rim of the browse protection that's been cut down. And then the rest of the browse protection was used in strips to anchor the edge of the uh, solarization plastic. This isn't common plastic. This is greenhouse plastic. It has an anti-condensate film on one side, the, down, the underside. We actually had to mark it. You can see in the, in the corner over here, we marked it to make sure that we installed it the right side to up, correct side down. Um, we did a little bit of analysis, and we found that clear plastic is the most effective. It lets all of the solar energy down and into the ground. Black plastic, you might want to be using black plastic. You're heating the plastic up, and the air is a great insulator, and you're not heating the soil up. So clear plastic is the best, and this anti-condensate is the best. This has 24 months of UV protection. So we are anticipating to leave these basins in place for more than a year. Most effective solar days are coming up. We're going to be hopefully have them all in place by the time we get to May, June, and July and have the types of, of long solar days that allow this soil to heat up to lethal temperatures. 120 degrees Fahrenheit is lethal to the pathogens. We have to get at least six to eight inches down, 120 degrees. This is what happens when you don't, I mean, Ted said it, get it clean, keep it clean, right? This, this, is, the this is the aftermath of not following that mantra. So why should we all be worried? We went well above industry standards. And we have infection. We weren't working in a urban environment. We weren't doing landscaping out in front of this building. We introduced these pathogens to a native ecosystem. And our, like your watersheds, our watershed is home to many endangered species that rely on specific plants, butterflies. I know you guys have butterflies that you worry about. Phytophthora are hard to kill. And Ted covered this, not necessarily as, as clearly as what I'm going to say. There are natural phytophthora out there. They exist but they coexist with our native California plants. We have exotic Phytophthora. We have, our plants have no defenses to these new introduced exotic Phytophthora, none. So we're killing native plants. The uncertainties. So native plants are, are drought tolerant. They're, they're they're used to looking drought stressed. You're going to go out and find native plants that have brown leaves on them, and they're not infected. You irrigate them in order to get a restoration program going, which is what we want to do, and it masks the infection because you have green growth happening, um, but, the, but the Phytophthora is present. Lab tests are destructive, so in order to go out and try and figure out whether you are infected or not, you're killing the plant. So you put 100,000 plug plants in the ground, and now you're trying to go figure out if you've got an infection, you're going to pull out some percentage of those. 2% enough? I don't know. But they're destructive. 2% still as the needle in the haystack photo that, that Ted put up there. You won't know unless you put, test them all. And we're struggling right now with the effectiveness of alternate planting methods. Seeds, cuttings, transplants. So what's the cost of not being clean? The first line here is, is the cost that we put in place. We have about $45 million uh, hard cost for construction. The first line is the prevention, the boot cleaning, the root wad cooking, the nursery inspections, the nursery protocols. The next two lines 
are the consequences of not being clean and keeping it clean. Testing and treatment. The solarization, 50 to $60 per three foot square of plastic by the time you cut it, place it, uh, get it nailed down, remove it. The plastic alone is a dollar a square foot. The third bullet down, that's what's gonna happen to us as a result of having to go to seed and pulling plants out. We're, we're adding a year to our ability to meet our success criteria as mitigation. And we, you saw Calaveras Dam, that, that's a big project. It had a very big biological opinion, you know, permit from Corps of Engineers. Very big, very expensive mitigation with a lot of, of maintenance at those sites. These sites are 120 acres. We've got, um, at, at San Antonio Creek, 120 acres. We have a team full time every day six to seven laborers going out there doing nothing but managing the irrigation, pulling weeds, and looking for different projects to do on site. So that two and a half, two to two and a half million dollars is the cost of extending our success period another year, one year. So that's the consequences. You're looking at three and a half million dollars is the consequences of not effectively following the prevention me mechanisms we put in place. And the ultimate risk, Ellen touched on it, if we don't successful at one of our mitigation sites, we have to do it again. That's the bottom line. So the challenges to address, and, and Ted touched on these, and, and I'm, I'm Mr. Optimism, <laughs> fortunately I, I get to look forward and try and be optimistic because I actually think it is going to be possible for us to design better specifications and protocols for the delivery of pest and pathogen free plants. But it's not going to be a performance spec. It's going to be much more rigorous and it's going to need to be much more specific about what we're looking for these nurseries and these contractors to do. Ted had a beautiful photograph of a piece of yellow iron with dirt on the tracks and dirt in the, in the wheel well. Can't happen. Zero tolerance. We have to improve methods for direct seeding. There are some susceptible plants like toyon and uh, sticky monkey flower that we need to potentially only do by seed. So we've got to figure out how to do that better. More accurate, inexpensive, and quick testing of materials to be delivered. Right now, you're looking at one to three week turnaround time at $30 a sample to figure out whether your, your plant lot is contaminated. Three weeks, your plant could be ready, you know, be root bound in three weeks. So you, we're looking for something that's potentially more effective and quicker. And all those dots in the ground, we gotta find a way to be, to be more effective in doing uh, in situ detection uh, other than just looking for brown leaves, which is not conclusive. And like Ted, we have a lot of people to thank, including him, for, our, for working on this. Um, it, this is a collaborative effort, and there's lots of good minds working on this. And the SFPUC is very proud to be, to be helping the, uh, lead this forward. Uh, I think, I think the inter you, you introduced this as a um, emerging issue. And what we've done in the last year, since we got this detection a year ago, is what we've done has been the, the beacon uh, bringing attention to this issue, and we're very proud of it. And we could not do it without all of these people, both consultants and regulators and uh, scientists, to help us do this. So thank you.